As the US considered how to best assist the ill-prepared South Korea in the Korean War, the possibility of deploying nuclear weapons became an increasingly probable action. What few know is the plans were actually drawn to end the conflict by positioning nuclear weapons in Japan to attack North Korea, and that B-29s carrying Mark IV nuclear bombs were sent to the British Isles in case of a needed launch against any response from the Soviet Union. The State of Korea At the beginning of 1950, intelligence officers in the United States feared escalating tensions in the Korean Peninsula. After World War II in 1948, Korea had been divided into two occupied sovereign states, with the border zone at the 38th parallel. A socialist nation had been set up in the north with supervision from the USSR, while a capitalist nation had been set up in the south with supervision from the US. The governments of each nation saw themselves as the only legitimate ruling entity for the peninsula, with the border considered a temporary obstacle. North Korea had inherited modern infrastructure and industry from the previous Japanese occupation, while South Korea was mostly an agricultural state. Tensions rose until war broke out, as the KPA, North Korea's Korean People's Army, invaded South Korea on June 25, 1950, with support from the Soviet Union and China, particularly the PVA, or People's Volunteer Army of China. In response, the Security Council of the United Nations accepted the creation of the United Nations Command, which would send troops from 21 nations to help save South Korea from the invasion. The U.S. provided 90% of the troops and other military personnel. As an almost immediate result of World War II, the war was fought with the same technologies, including a threat of nuclear weapons that almost materialized. Boeing B-29 The main American bomber used during the Korean War was the Boeing B-29, a propeller-driven heavy bomber. It could reach high altitudes for strategic bombing and could also serve in low altitudes for nighttime incendiary bombing. The B-29 may be best remembered for its role in dropping the Little Boy and Fat Man on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, respectively. It was also one of the most expensive military programs of World War II, at $3 billion for design and development, which would be equivalent to around $42 billion today. 65 of the original models were adapted to carry nuclear bombs during the course of the war as part of the Silver Plate Project, the Air Force's collaboration with the Manhattan Project. The modified aircraft introduced fuel injection to the engine and reversible propellers, and had all guns removed save for the ones on the tail, so that weight could be reduced. These planes played a major role in the Korean War, being deployed from 1950 to 1953. In the first few months, the bombers used regular bombs to destroy strategic North Korean posts and industrial holdings. This changed when Soviet MiG-15 fighters started being deployed to the peninsula, taking down 28 B-29s in 1950. This new threat led their role to be reduced to night raids of North Korean supplies. In only six months, B-29s dropped at least six ASM-A1 Tarzan bombs, a radio-controlled conventional bomb and the largest to be used in the war to destroy bridges, dams, and other crucial targets. The aircraft were also used to drop leaflets for the unsuccessful Operation Moolah, which offered a financial reward to any pilot who defected and brought a MiG-15 along. At the time, no members of the United Nations Command had an equally powerful aircraft to counter the MiG. For the Korean War, there were 20,000 sorties of B-29s that dropped 200,000 tons of bombs. Only one MiG-15 was taken down by a B-29. American Involvement in the War after the United Nations Command was initially set up, President Truman ordered that B-29s be sent to the United Kingdom in case it became necessary to launch an attack against the Soviet Union. The nuclear bombs eventually carried by the B-29s were marked fours with a plutonium core, of which the U.S. had 300 stockpiled. The U.S. had an almost complete monopoly on nuclear weapons, and at the very least, tactical superiority in the nuclear department for the majority of the war, since the Soviet Union's first airdrop test was not carried out until 1951. Back on the Korean Peninsula, the South Korean army had been ill-prepared for the invasion that began in 1950. North Korea was in better shape to fight a war, with vast industrial and infrastructural access. The United Nations Command, and by extension the United States, would need to do most of the heavy lifting for the war. Three weeks after the B-29s were sent to the UK, ten nuclear-armed B-29s were sent to Guam in hopes of scaring and deterring the North Koreans. Ten more were later sent, for a total of twenty nuclear-armed bombers. 
yet they all lacked a crucial component. The plutonium cores had remained in military custody back in the US. There was no initial intention to nuke these countries, just to intimidate them. Things wouldn't remain that way for long. A tactic that had been kept in America's back pocket, deemed too risky, was put into place. In September, the UN command launched an amphibious counter-offensive landing at Incheon, only a few miles away from Seoul. The KPA was pushed back, with the fighting reaching the Yalu River on the Chinese border in October. The move allowed UN command to take back Seoul and cut off North Korea's supply lines. The US was optimistic that it could deliver a South Korean victory by Christmas. The B-29s, still using conventional bombs, hit key spots such as bridges, trains, ammunition storage units, and military factories in an effort to exhaust North Korea's ability to wage war. All this was done under UN approval, which kept the bombings at 50 miles or more from the Yalu River. The UN command took over almost all of North Korea, even Pyongyang. Some of the bomber squads were sent back to the US, and bombing was reduced as UN command ground troops advanced. The war seemed like it would be over at any point. Chinese Intervention Heeding calls to action from the Soviet Union and the scattered North Korean forces, China moved to intervene in the conflict, sending troops in late November from Manchuria. The Chinese support forces were well trained and counted with seasoned military strategists. They quickly began reclaiming North Korean territory. China was unfazed by the nuclear-armed B-29s waiting by in Guam. Certain worries about involving nuclear weapons had held the United States back from fully launching such an attack. In part, no fully armed atomic bombs had left the continental US up to that point since the Second World War, due to limited understanding of repercussions from their use. The military worried that nuking North Korea might still not lead China to surrender their support, that since the threat of nuclear warfare wasn't enough of a deterrent, actual nuclear attacks wouldn't be either. Furthermore, there was worry in the intelligence community that if the Soviet Union got directly involved, their recent nuclear developments might turn the Korean War into a full-blown nuclear world war. What these considerations did accomplish, however, was the drawing of strategic plans for battling North Korea through nuclear warfare. Putting aside the far less premeditated attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, this was the first time the US involved itself in strategizing nuclear warfare. The Nuclear Option in November of 1950, President Truman spoke to the press, expressing to reporters that atomically bombing Korea was a possibility. The following partial transcript comes from the office of the historian under the Department of State. Quote, the President, We will take whatever steps are necessary to meet the military situation, just as we always have. That includes every weapon that we have. Question, Mr. President, you said every weapon that we have. Does that mean that there is active consideration of the use of the atomic bomb? The President. There's always been active consideration of its use. I don't want to see it used. It's a terrible weapon, and it should not be used on innocent men, women, and children who have nothing whatever to do with this military aggression. That happens when it is used. Some members of the press were scandalized when Truman seemed to imply that military commanders in charge of the nuclear bombs, if they were sent, would have discretionary power to launch them. The White House had to release an official statement later that day clarifying that, quote, it should be emphasized that by law, only the president can authorize the use of the atom bomb, and no such authorization has been given. If and when such authorization should be given, the military commander in the field would have charge of the tactical delivery of the weapon. The following April, Truman followed through on his words. He allowed nine fission bombs, fully armed with their plutonium cores, to be transported by the Air Force to Japan. Even more nuclear-capable B-29s were sent to Japan, with the Strategic Air Command setting up a control team in the Japanese capital. The pilots in Japan and Guam only needed an order, and they would obliterate North Korea. The then General of the UN Command, Douglas MacArthur, was strongly considering the nuclear option, as China continued to make significant gains. Around that time, the commander of the 8th Army led Operation Thunderbolt to reclaim the south bank of the Han River. General MacArthur, on the other hand, was increasingly at odds with the President, believing he should have the power to unilaterally decide on nuclear use and threatening China with obliteration unless the nation surrendered. Furthermore, he directed the war effort entirely from Tokyo, not spending a single full day in Korea. He believed that a full conquering victory was the only path forward, while Truman wanted a ceasefire and diplomatic withdrawal from the Asian continent. Truman replaced Douglas MacArthur with General Matthew Ridgway as commander of the UN forces. 
The general was given discretionary authority over the use of nuclear bombs by the president, possibly because Truman knew he would not use them unless it became absolutely necessary. General Ridgway also took over as military governor of Japan and supreme commander for the Allied powers during that time, and used the first title to assist in the restoration of Japan's independent sovereignty. If there is someone to thank for stopping the Korean War from becoming a nuclear conflict, that would be General Ridgway. His arrival lifted troop spirits, and his strategies started changing the landscape of the conflict once more, driving it into a stalemate. In October of 1951, the U.S. conducted Operation Hudson Harbor. General Ridgway gave General Curtis LeMay command over nuclear strikes. B-29 bombers practiced runs from Okinawa to North Korea, carrying dummy nukes. The intention was both to practice where the strikes would hit if the order was given, and to intimidate the enemy forces. Planned targets included military bases, power plants, key North Korean holdings, and even cities in the region of Manchuria, which would dissuade both the Chinese and Soviets from continued participation. The actual bombing was still considered a last resort until a ceasefire was called in 1953. The end of the nuclear threat. The war of attrition between the involved parties and the initial risk of nuclear escalation came to an end with the Korean Armistice Agreement in July of 1953. The KPA, PV, and UN Command signed it, but South Korea refused to. The Korean demilitarized zone was established to each side of the border, and peace came to the peninsula despite the lack of an official peace treaty. The agreement also launched a set of continuing and often stalled peace talks. The prospect of nuclear war in the Korean peninsula was put to rest for a time.